Making, making the, the legal, legal case for reparations today, part three. Stay, Stay tuned, tuned right after, after this. this. That Corbin and Corbin legal team Fighting for the rights of the people That father the daughter team Investing in the youth When the system ain't treating them equal Providing truth for our people We able to reach them So anytime you get accused for a crime And Lord knows you ain't do it We here to get you through it Exemplifying prudence And glorifying God Making sure you're compensated For other people's doings Our vision is to be one of the best We're small enough to focus on your matter Throughout the neighborhoods of Dallas Working constantly and making sure your rights are protected a firm team of lawyers, aggressive, effective A team that has your back in the courtroom Two well-spoken black lawyers in the courtroom Investing time and resources when it's evident that you were treated wrong Now you walking out of Dallas courtroom with a settlement Corbin and Corbett, the father-daughter legal tag team that has your back in the courtroom Our purpose is simple, to obtain a favorable outcome for each client And glorify Christ in all we do Our vision is to be one of the best and most Hello, Hello Rebels. Rebels, my, my name, name is, is Attorney Chloe Corbett, Corbett, a.k.a. The Judge of Justice, and with, with me I have Attorney Augustus Corbett, a.k.a. The Minister of Justice. We are the Defiant Lawyers, who put legal analysis of trending politics, policies, personalities, and policies to empower you to defy this unjust legal system. Before we get into today's topic, why don't you go ahead and like this video, hit the subscribe button, Share this video with your family and friends so that they can get this informational, educational, and entertaining knowledge. Thank you so much for joining us today. With that, guys, happy Saturday, happy Juneteenth, and I'll see you next time. I am doing very, very, very well. Hope you are. Happy Juneteenth, pre, or oh, yeah, what's the word? Uh, Juneteenth Eve. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, actually, Juneteenth is on Monday, right? That's the actual official day that we're celebrating. It is tomorrow. So I guess it still is Eve. So happy Juneteenth Eve. Yes. And I'm, I'm so glad you celebrated Juneteenth. Yes. And I'm so glad you celebrated Juneteenth for many years. Um, for those of you who don't know Juneteenth, it stands for June 1865, when the slaves in Galveston, Texas, received word that they were free, that President Abraham Lincoln had given the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, in the slavery back in 1863, but the slaves in Galveston did not find out until June 19th of 1865. So there's been a very celebration of June 19th. Um, and in the two years, almost since then, and it just recently became a national holiday. Absolutely, and for the past couple of uh, weeks, we have been talking about reparations. As Chloe said, we're making the the legal case for reparations, and today is going to be the final uh, installment of that discussion. I think we made the case, Chloe. What do you think? I certainly think we did. Um, for all of our new viewers who did not see part one and part two, I highly encourage you all to go watch those first two um, episodes in this series so that you can get a backstory on reparations on um, the term 48 in the new, our definition of reparations, how we define it, and our arguments for it. So I encourage you all to go back, look at part one and part two. Yes, so. You know, we just, you can kind of consider week one and week two or part one, part two as the opening statement. And then we begin to present some evidence. Um, last week, we spent some time talking about the definition, our definition of reparations. Um, today, we're going to look at um, who benefited from reparations and make the case for why we deserve to be uh, compensated or repaired for all the damage that was done uh, to the African American community. And the damage has been substantial. It has been very, very, very 
substantial. And basically, without reparations, the wealth gap between African Americans and white Americans will likely never be closed. We can do all the things that we know to do to um, to be successful financially, get the best education, save money to the bone, make very, very good uh, financial decisions. All the other things that we know that tend to create wealth uh, in America, and we still would not close the wealth gap because it is that wide. It is that big uh, between black Americans and, um, and white Americans. Our, Our music, music has been going in the past. past. Like a few minutes. Oh, I don't, I'm sorry. I don't hear any music. Uh, what about now? Yes. <laughs> That's it? it? It's gone? It's, it's gone, gone now. now. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. Um, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm actually using a new piece of equipment, so, um, I don't know what happened, but the music should have been, should have been gone, but it's gone now, right? It's It's gone gone now. now. All right. So as I was saying, the wealth gap is just really, really, really big. So big that without reparations, we cannot close it. We cannot close it. And so that's why it's so very, very important. So we got some slides. We're going to go back and show how America actually benefited tremendously, Chloe, because one of the things uh, whites love to say is, why should they have to be taxed to pay reparations when they didn't benefit from slavery? Well, I have two responses to that. Reparations are based not only on slavery and Jim Crow, but reparations are also based on present-day systemic racism. Mm-hmm. So reparations are based on, based on all three, number one. And number two, it, it is just completely, totally ridiculous for white Americans to say that they have not benefited from slavery, Jim Crow, and systemic racism. It is the reason that black America, uh, pardon me, white Americans have about 10 times more wealth than black Americans. Okay? So it's 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 just a ridiculous notion. Yeah, yeah it, doesn't it doesn't make, make any sense. sense. And, and I mean, I mean um, um Sorry, I, you, you all, all may hear, hear my, my dog, dog in the background. background. <laughs> this, this is a live show. show. She's, she's kind of going, going crazy. crazy. But um, I, mean, I mean, America, America would, would not be the superpower that it is, and we would not have the economy that we had today if it, not, if it were not for the slave labor force um, that occurred, you know, from the 16, 17, 1800s until it was abolished. Uh, I don't believe we probably would not be in the position that we are today. Um, to be one of the world's superpowers if it were not for that force. So it's, I mean, it's just completely false for white Americans today to say that they have not benefited um, from slavery because we America would not be the economic nation that it, that it is if it were not for slavery as well. That's right. So the slide that we have up now, and we're going to go through a lot of slides, so we're going to move kind of fast. Um The slide that we have now begins with how the American um, colonies were able to acquire the land here in America. Uh, Native Americans were basically robbed of this land. And, And this shows... Okay, so we're getting... I just got that your mic doesn't sound as good. Um, Let me see what I can do to fix that. Okay, go ahead, try now, Chloe. Yes, check one, check two. 
All right. So let us know if that sounds better. Uh, all right. So the, the story of the American um, empire starts with Native Americans. They were the rightful landowners. Okay, we got that straight now. So they were the they were the rightful landowners before the Europeans arrived. And the Europeans stole, basically took through war, um, you know, the landmass. So from this map here, we see that they were able to acquire uh, through the military, um, the New Orleans area, the Mississippi, Alabama, uh, Georgia area, the Florida area, and um, and then later on, they, I mean, they, North Carolina, South Carolina, uh, Virginia, and so on. Um, so the story of slavery actually begins with the story of the Native Americans. Um, so having yeah. a, so having Chloe acquired this landmass, then the settlers got the bright idea of we need someone now to harvest this land. And I always wondered, why didn't they say, let's harvest our own land? I mean, why, 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 why did they think they needed someone else to harvest their land, to do the work? What do you think about that? Um, <laughs> I think that they, I mean, I, I feel like the European empires, well, he, they had a, they had already had a precedent of, you know, colonizing different countries, yes. going in different nations, um, you know, bringing back slavery, using slavery forces, pill pillaging the, the nation, taking the resources. So I think they thought, well, hey, let's just do that with this new land continent that we found as well. That is it had already been done before. Yeah. But do you also think a little bit of laziness in there? I mean, because they, they love to call black Americans lazy. I mean, they, they always, not not all, I'm not generalizing all whites, but that is sort of the, you know, a slur that is often applied to black Americans. We're lazy. We don't like to work. I think, I think that is, I think that is it um, because they could have got out there themselves and, and worked the land themselves, but they didn't. They had to go steal people and, and make people slaves. And it's not something that they just did in America. They did it all over the globe, Africa, um, Southeast Asia, South America. So they were just falling into the patterns when they came over to the new world. And I think you make an excellent point, though, that by the time they arrived here, they had already had a history and a precedent of stealing people from Africa and working. They did so in Europe long before they arrived here. They did so in, you know, in, in the um, United Kingdom, um, Portuguese, Portugal, uh, various places on the continent of Africa, pardon me, on the continent of, of Europe. So I guess they just sort of did what they always had done. Yeah. Yep. All right, so they used the military, used superior, they're basically guns. You know, the Indians, the Native Americans were using bow and arrows, from my understanding. Uh, but the Europeans had created guns, so they were able to use that superior military might to basically uh, take the land. And then, as I said earlier, they got the bright idea now, let's go get some Africans to work the land force free. Now, this next slide here, you can't see it very well, I don't think, okay? But it says acquisition of cotton land. So, so they begin to start f uh, harvesting and farming cotton um, on these areas that we see here, okay? Do you see that? Yes. Um, looks like there is... Some comments well, on YouTube. I want to acknowledge the political scientists. Good afternoon to you as well. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you. So cotton is king, is the old saying. So they started harvesting cotton in those southern states. 
Um, they stole the land and then they stole um, folks to work the land. Right. Yeah. And I, I remember the uh, cotton gin mill. I think it was created right around this time. And that's really when they began to go into overdrive with using um, slave labor to um, manufacture cotton. And that's really when it went into a lot of super production uh, with these colonies. And it was right around what well, is the time that is shown in this um, slide from 1840 to 1850. I mean, 18, 1814 to 1840, excuse me. Okay. All right. So let's see the progression here. So the distribution of cotton production by county in, in the 1800s, uh, the darker the, the, the uh, patches, that means more cotton was being produced. So we see uh, some dark spots um, in the Maryland, D.C., Virginia area on down through North Carolina, some parts of South Carolina and Georgia, and lighter spots in Virginia, um, Kentucky, Tennessee, um, cotton production hadn't quite in the eighteen in eighteen hundred hadn't quite gotten down to to larger parts of Georgia and Florida and and, and so on. But it's coming because as we see, eighteen forty, now cotton production was uh, just throughout the South. There, uh, it's amazing just how how the Southern um, economy was so dependent on using cotton. And um, if it were not for that dependence on using cotton and using the slave force to manufacture that cotton, there's no telling where South, the Southern states would be in terms of their economy. Um, you know, they uh, the government always likes to talk about the American, um, the American dream and Amer American intellectualism, but they could have used other ways, come up with other ideas, come up with other innovation to get their economy off the ground without enslaving an entire group of people and using a slave force. So to me, it, it, it it's excuses for, the, for um, the Southern states who have said, well, we need slavery for our economy. And then on the other hand, they say, well, we're the land of innovation and the land of Amer the American dream. They don't go hand in hand. Because instead of innovating, you know, under a capitalistic society, what we're in, they were just dependent on um, on slave slavery, which is that reprehensible. Well, I mean, in their minds, they're thinking we can maximize um, the production of cotton by using basically free labor. If we got a workforce here that will work as long as we say, do whatever we say for a fraction of what it would, what, of what it normally would cost, then in their minds, that's just maximizing profit. Yeah, and that's, that's some of the issues that I have with capitalism. Um, but that's a different topic for a different day. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But it's just, and then to use the Bible, you know, in the in the first part of this series, we spoke about how there's precedent for reparations in the Bible, but for them to then not use the Bible to try to justify sl slavery when we know that it was just for economic reasons to try to make as much money as possible, um, that's another hypocrisy with with this go with our government and with um the southern states as well. Yeah, and since you mentioned the Bible, there there is certainly precedent for reparations. Now, they will point out that there is also precedent for slavery in the Bible. And I've had this discussion, uh, I remember I had this discussion in law school uh, with some whites, and I pointed out, yes, there is slavery in the Bible. Um, so is divorce, so is murder. So is rape, but none of that was sanctioned by the Lord. That was never God's intention. Slavery, like divorce, was never God's intention. All of that is a result of the fall of man. So, yes, we do see slavery in the Bible, but 
Again, if we're going to be honest in our exegesis of Scripture, we need to go back to Genesis chapters 1 before the fall of man, and there we will see um, exactly what God had in mind for humans, and it did not include slavery. Yeah. Period. (laughs) Period. All right, so by the 1840s, the cotton industry had spread throughout most of the South. All right. Now, 1860, it spread completely over southeast, southeastern states. By now, it was also in the state of Texas, where we reside, and Louisiana. I mean, it was all over because, again, cotton was king back then. It was making the country a lot of money. And as you pointed out, there were alternatives. But if you got this large land mass, free or cheap labor, and I say cheap because, uh, you know, the only thing they had to, to, to pay was food, what little food there was they gave to the enslaved folks. And, you know, I, I, don't, I don't like calling our ancestors slaves, to be honest. I prefer the word enslaved. Um, slave is not what... God calls us. Um, we were in a condition of enslavement, our ancestors. So I prefer to use that. And I don't like using the term master, slave yeah. and master. Um, I prefer to use the terms enslaver or plantation owners. It's the way I tend to look at it. But yes, cotton by, by now was was... Like I said, King, uh, it was making the country a lot of money. The nation's wealth in the early days was built and established on cotton. And we're going to see in just a moment that it wasn't just benefiting southern states. It was benefiting northern states in a tremendous way, in a tremendous way. And not just southern and northern states, but Um, the states that would also become a part of the country. Uh, It was all based on the production and sale of cotton, which was all based on the slave labor of Africans. Yeah, I mean, that's how this nation became a superpower, like we were saying earlier. And that's what um, allowed America to grow as rapidly as it did in such a short amount of time, because... I mean, when you look at our history compared to um, Africa, countries in Asia, European countries, we are very, very, very young, very young compared to those other ancient um, governments and systems and and countries. And what allowed us to develop so quickly was them, the legal use of the enslaved people and slave labor um, to have this cotton boom, which led into the Industrial Revolution in the um, early 20th century as well. True. All right. Um, we we have another slide up here. Um, distribution of slave population by county from 1800, 1840, and 1860. And as you can see, uh, the darker that it gets is the amount of the slave population. And that in, that that in, in eighteen hundred, and we're gonna I'm gonna pull up eighteen forty and eighteen sixty. Right, in 1800. The dark part of that, the lower section of um, the southern United States, I mean, how dark it is, that just tells you um, how reliant those southern states' economy was on um, slave labor because it had a high population of slaves as compared to the uh, to you, the northern United States and the western states as well. And I want to tell the listeners to stay Um, to stay with us throughout this show today because the last thing that we're going to show is how much, how much reparations African-Americans should get. And the number is staggering. So hang out with us all the way to the end. That's going to be the last thing that we show and talk about. Yeah. All right, so... Chloe, this shows that as cotton grew, the enslaved population grew, 
right? So they they reached out more and more. In other words, they went back to Africa even more and more and more as they saw how prosperous cotton was for the country, for the for the for the colonies, for the states, right? So as it grew, the slave population grew. So here, can't see this that well, um, but we do see that in the sort of mid-Atlantic states, a little bit above North Carolina, you see that the slave, the enslaved population um, was, was large, and I really would like to see this closer. Uh, I'm hoping folks can see it um, closer because it shows the ports where a lot of enslaved people came um, from, from Africa. And the three major ports are, let's see, the three major ports are New Orleans, mm -hmm. Charleston, and up in Virginia, I think, I think maybe Norfolk, Virginia, and even, even Maryland. Mm -hmm. And so those were the major ports, okay, where slave ships were coming in. And then the Africans were then distributed from those ports. For example, I know from the, the elders in my family that there's a, where, where I grew up is in the Wilmington, North Carolina area. And Wilmington was also a, major slave port. So the slaves would come in there in Wilmington, and there's a river that runs from Wilmington to a, a, lar a large part of North Carolina. It's called the, the Cape Fear River. And so the enslaved folks would, um, would be transported by, by that river to various parts of North Carolina and even South Carolina. Uh, by way of the Cape Fear River. Um, all right, so 1860, the slave, the enslaved population you see now has spread completely throughout the southeastern states and even the mid-Atlantic states. And that, again, was because cotton was just so profitable that they're doing everything they can to you know, create cotton forms throughout the South, basically. Yeah, that's that supply and demand um, that is, you know, associated with capitalism and free market. Um, the demand for cotton became so exponential because it became, it, it was just everywhere that they started going back to the motherland um, to supply, um, to, to, to supply to try to meet the demands of the cotton. And how did they try to, get the supplies they considered human beings, Africans, black people, um, just as a vehicle to meet the demand of cotton. And it, I mean, it's just, when you just think about it and you just say it, we get so desensitized to it. Yes. Um, it's especially tough. us because we talk about it all the time. Right. Um, and people who don't talk about it, it's whitewashed. It's, it's not really, you really don't go into it but they literally saw us as just a way to make money to meet the demand of making cotton. So how did they do that? Okay, let's go get some more black people, bring them over from Africa, enslave them, and make them meet this demand of, of cotton. I mean, it's just, it's such a warped thinking, such a evil thinking, honestly. Yeah, it's diabolic. Yeah. And yes, I mean, you, you expressed it very well. Um, in that they saw the demand for cotton, so they went and 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 continue to bring Africans over here um, to produce that cotton. And I yeah. want everybody to keep in mind that we don't have the northern states here, but they are participating very much in this entire slave industry. All right, yep. we're going to show that. And, just and by the way, while we're still on this slide, I want to point out to people, because in part one and part two, we talked about um, General Williams' order, which is 
directly after the Civil War, um, there was a a a federal order that would have given land 400,000 acres of land to um, previously enslaved black people. And it would have gone from South Carolina all the way down to Florida. They had seized 400,000 acres of land that they were going to give to the newly freed slaves. And they were going to the, to divide that to households of these newly freed slaves and give those slaves 40 acres and a mule. And I think that this map that you had up here, dad, just shows um, kind of the corridor of land that the government was going to give us. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. Um, president Lincoln was assassinated. The next president that came in, you know, completely overturned the reconstruction laws and policies that, a, that Lincoln's administration was trying to put into place. And we never got our 40 acres and a mule, meaning we never got our reparations. That's right. Now this map, ironically, you see the state of South Carolina, it's very dark. Uh, which indicates there were a lot of enslaved Africans in that state, a lot, uh, especially on the coast. And, Chloe, as you said, um, this was the corridor that would be used uh, for those uh, 40 acres. Now, ironically, that, that dark area there, uh, I grew up not far from that area, and it is where Myrtle Beach is, and a beautiful beach, by the way. I just love going to it growing up. But a part of Myrtle Beach was owned by blacks for a long time, until recent, until like the last 40, 50 years when um, developers began to steal black land. So although they, you know, most blacks didn't end up with those 40 acres, uh, blacks still through hard work and just grinding still ended up buying, purchasing a lot of land. So if you go to Murder, Murder Beach today, if you go, I think, to North Murder Beach, there are still uh, black owners, a few uh, blacks who own the areas there, uh, who own the um, some of the land there. It's undeveloped, it's not like the other areas, but I, I always go through there when I'm in the Myrtle Beach area. I always ride through and try to, you know, buy something and so on to 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 help the blacks there. All right, let me Yes, y'all gotta see. We do have some comments that yes, go I ahead. wanna acknowledge real quick. Okay. Um I see Alicia's up here. Hey girl, thanks for tuning in. We appreciate it. Yes. I'm no nun, another rebel. He he or she is up here. And they said that Eli Whitney's cotton gin was a big part of the slavery boom. Yeah. Uh, we mentioned that earlier. It, it's amazing how much the cotton gin just just turned um, turned the, the the slave system produced so much cotton, and then obviously you know the 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 um, the I don't want to say masters, but the pl plantation owners, as you said earlier, to try to meet that demand, they went to Africa and still kept getting slave after slave after slave. It's, it's a shame. And no known brought brought out how. Um, Eli Whitney thought that producing the cotton gin, uh, because cotton had kind of, you know, production had sort of decreased and they were about to get away from it in the Southern States. But then when he invented that cotton gin, um, the plantation owner said, Oh, wait, hold on. This is a great invention. So we're going to, we're going to ramp up more cotton production. So, um, so they didn't move away from cotton production as a result of that um, invention. Thank you for that uh, comment. No, no. All right. So 1840. Okay. Now is that a little backwards? Yes. Yes. Should be 1840 before 1860. Um, so 1840, um, uh, the enslaved population wasn't, wasn't quite as big as in 1860. Um, so again, that's growing as the cotton industry is growing. Let me see if I can go back to show you what I mean here. That's the cotton industry. So the slave, the enslaved population is increasing as the cotton production is increasing. All right, now we'll go to another slide. And by the way, let me acknowledge that much of this information um, is coming from two sources. 
this great book entitled From Here to Equality, Reparations for Black Americans in the 21st Century. It's a great, great, great book. Great, great book. I think it's the best book written on reparations. And also um, we used uh, The Half Has Not Been Told by Edward Batiste um, or Batista. Uh, The Half Has Not Been Told, and he chronicles how profitable the cotton industry was for uh, this nation. All right. Now, from here to equality, these are quotes from that book. And it says, from the, from the docks of Providence, Rhode Island. So now, Chloe, we're getting ready to see how the northern states benefited from the cotton industry. Okay? Mm-hmm. From the docks of Providence, Rhode Island, and Boston, and Salem, Massachusetts, a round robin of outgoing ships carrying dairy products, fish, and rum, followed vessels unloading slaves, sugar, and molasses, providing provisions for these slaves and for the vast plantations in the U.S. South, the Caribbean, and South America required the efforts of staggering numbers of financiers, merchants, shippers, insurers, real estate brokers, auctioneers, and laborers. Now, this is so important. We just think about the enslaved people and what they're producing. But all these various industries are being created to service the cotton industry and the, and the slave industry. And, um, and we also often for, forget, Chloe, and leave out the enslaved Africans that were in the Caribbeans, uh, in the Caribbean and in South America, okay? Huge populations. In fact, there are more African uh, descendants in Brazil than there are in, in, in North America. Mm. That's, I mean, that's amazing. A lot of people, just like you said, that don't realize the slate, um, Africans to America was a much smaller percentage of the Africans that went to South America and Latin America. Um, I can't, I I remember reading a figure on it and I can't remember it now off the top of my head, but it's, it's, I want to say it's two, maybe even three to one that went to South America versus um, the Africans that came here to, to North America, which is insane to think about. And I mean, what you just said about the number of um, African descendants in just Brazil alone, that doesn't include all of the other countries Brazil. in yep. South America. Just Brazil uh, is amazing too. And I want to point out again, to service all of these enslaved people and all the products that they were creating and all the cottage industries that were associated with this cotton industry and with this slave industry. I mean, that people made a lot of money. People yeah. were making buku money, not just the plantation owners, but again, the people who are servicing the plantations. They were all, <laughs> I mean, creating great, great sums of money that enabled the white population to start getting way ahead of, uh, of African Americans. And to this day, to this day, they have been able to accumulate that wealth where we have not to this day. And it all started in slavery and as a result of the, of the, of the cotton industry and, and enslaved African people. Yeah. And not just, not just um, plantation owners, owners, um, you know, men up North U S (laughs) presidents, They've benefited from slave labor as well. There were George Washington owned slaves. Thomas Jefferson owned slaves. Other presidents owned slaves. Um, and so even can, our can the say, leader of America. Can we say they enslaved people? They enslaved people, excuse me. They enslaved people. 
So I, my it's just a little 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 thing, a little pet peeve that I have. I don't someone corrected me years ago and 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 I appreciated it and it sort of sticks sticks out of my head even to this day. Yes, please, please um continue to remind me when I say that. They enslaved people. So um the leadership of this country benefited from it as well. That was that's that's what I want people to see. All right, so another quote from From Here to Equality. Slavery has long been identified in the national consciousness as a Southern institution. The time to bury that myth is overdue. Slavery is a story about America, all of America. The nation's wealth from the very beginning depended upon the exploitation of black people on three continents. Okay, powerful quotation. Mm -hmm. All right, slave-grown cotton was the national currency that seeded the growth of several American cities before the Civil War. Between 1821 and 1860, New York City, a major importer of cotton, became the nation's and the world's largest commercial and financial center. And it still enjoys that distinction to this very, very day. Mm. And it all started from the cotton industry. So what's that saying? What that is saying is that New York City were, would do business with the um, plantation owners and they would, you know, bring the cotton that the enslaved people harvested and, you know, use the cotton for whatever they wanted to use in the text in the textiles um in new york city so even though new york city directly did not enslave people they were benefited from the work that the enslaved people produced which was the cotton well i mean which is and and it's funny because when you go up north you hear a lot well you know we're not racist or you know, there was never slavery here but you all benefited just like the rest of america oh just like the american government you benefited from it and still to, to still do to this day. And when we talk about benefit, I mean that, look, the New York City area economy and the state and those northern states were built on cotton. Mm -hmm. that, that old saying, cotton is king, I didn't coin that. Blacks didn't coin that. Whites coined that phrase. Because they know the money they made from the cotton industry from, from the very southern tip of Florida to the very northern tip of whatever state is up there. What is it? Rhode Island or <laughs> something? Maine. <laughs> Maine. <Something. yeah. laughs> whatever. <laughs> I mean, cotton was king. And as we said a moment ago, the financiers, the bankers, the brokers, the people who loaded the ships, the people who unloaded the ships, they were all whites making tons and tons and tons of money, um, sending food back to the plantations. Um, so the ship, think about it, just like we see these big trucks today. The ships would come in with, with the load of enslaved people, and then they would... Uh, take a load of molasses and 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 guns and food back down to the plantations. So that all that involved money, 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 money. All right. Yeah. So yep. we're going to start looking here in a second at how and what specific corporations benefited greatly, and this is just scratching the surface, actually. So this slide says, New York City and Southern Cotton were a matched paired, sewn together by financial rewards and economic expansion. By the eve of the war, hundreds of businesses in New York and countless more throughout the, the North were, com were connected to and dependent on cotton. As New York became the fulcrum of the U.S. cotton trade, merchants, shippers, auctioneers, Bankers, brokers, insurers, and thousands of others were drawn to the uh, burgeoning urban center 
So when we look at New York, you know who who doesn't like to, who doesn't who doesn't like going to New York and spending some time in New York? It's a busy city. It's everything is there. Wall Street is there. Commerce is there. It is the largest financial center in the world. Well, that happened because of the cotton industry out of slavery. Mm. The financial epic center of our country got its roots from the from the lives and the bodies of black people. That is the point that I'm trying to make. When we look at the very financial center, the very political center of this nation, it was all built on the backs and lives and torture and murder and enslavement and rape of black African people. And that's why we need reparations. This is why we need reparations. And this is why education is so important because there is a concerted effort to downplay the contributions that black people have made to this country. Um, here in Texas, here in Texas, under the rules, rules of not teaching critical race theory, the governor has signed into legislation. Basically, you can't teach that slavery was bad. You can't teach the true history of slavery because they don't want to make white kids and white people feel bad. So now there's a whole new generation of, of children growing up and even their, their parents, you know, people my age, millennials who don't know the whole story, the whole history, who don't have this information, who don't realize that we're able to do what we're able to do. We're able to have Apple, um, Microsoft, the government that we have because of the, uh, the enslaved people and what they went through. That's right. You got to educate yourselves, people. There's an effort. There's an effort to downplay it and, and erase it. So when you go back to New York City, the epic center, the financial epic center of our country, of the world, actually, and you see those tall buildings, those corporations, those banks, et cetera, the foundation of all of that was built on black folks. Now, let's look Man, at and I love going to New York. Uh, I'm going to be thinking about this now. <laughs> yes, I, I love New York as well. We have family there. I was yeah. there, actually. But... It, wow. I mean, we have to, we're making the case for reparations. We're making the case. And you, you, brought out, you, you brought out something so important, Chloe, that whites want to now ignore this and wipe it out of the history books and not talk about it and not teach on it and just act like it didn't happen. Not only did it happen, but we are still reeling from the results of it. And they are still profiting from it. Yeah. We can't forget it. We will never forget it until there has been recognition, repudiation, repentance, and reparations for those injustices. Yeah. All right. Now, let's look at some of the, 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 the players. And this is, again, just the tip of the iceberg. J.P. Morgan Chase. Mm -hmm. Jonius Spencer Morgan, father of J. Pierpont Morgan, which is where we get J.P. Morgan, had his son study the cotton trade in the South at the start of his business career. Morgan Sr., a Massachusetts native who became a major banker and cotton broker in London, understood that knowledge of the cotton trade was essential to prospering in the commercial world 
in the 1850s. Now, all of these mm-hmm. quotes are coming from, from here to equality. So we bank with Chase. Okay. Several accounts. Yeah. Several accounts with Chase. With Chase. Chase started on the backs of black people. Let that sink in. Lehman Brothers, an investment bank that went out of business in 2008, I believe. I grew up hearing about Lehman Brothers. I've never, I had never heard of them until we did this research. Yes, I grew up hearing about Lehman Brothers and they were like just an institution that I would have never imagined would have gone out of business. And I had no idea that they had been knee deep in slavery. Hmm. but they were Lehman brothers widely viewed as one of the nation's most powerful investment banks filed for bankruptcy in 2008. That was during the great recession. It collapsed under the stress of the mortgage lending crisis, but Lehman began in 1850 as a cotton brokerage in Montgomery, Alabama. It served as the state of Alabama's fiscal agent at one point, and was designated to service the state's debts, interest payments, and other obligations. In 1870, the Lehman Brothers um, spearheaded the formation of the New York Stock Exchange. I mean, the New York Cotton Exchange. Mm. Isn't that something? So so what they would do is they would buy cotton from the plantation owners, store it in their warehouses, and then sell it. So they were like the middlemen between uh, the the plantation owners and folks who wanted cotton, you know, to 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 use to um, uh, to create clothing and other um, textile types of companies. So Lehman Brothers literally, literally made billions. Again, from the backs, the lives of black African people. And what did the, what did black people get? Nothing. Nothing. But broken backs. And broken promises. Broken promises and broken lives. Real estate and shipping magnet John Jacob Astor made his fortune in furs, the Chinese opium trade, and the transportation of cotton to global ports. Now, this man, Chloe, you may not hear a lot about him, but he owned large swaths of Manhattan Island and was considered one of the wealthiest people alive. The word wealthiest is misspelled. But he is not known very well, but he bought lots and lots of of land um, on the Manhattan Island. And look, you own land as precious as Manhattan Island, you, (laughs) you will be uber, uber, uber rich. And he built that fortune on the cotton industry which again was built obviously on slavery. Two global ports. So two ports all around the world. Um, So not only did America's economy benefit benefit from it, um, but so did other countries as well, international countries. And what we were talking about in the other two parts about how, um, let's say what, what we did for the Jewish people um, in the early 1900s, after World War II and the Holocaust, um, America and European nations came together, and as we know, you know, they gave the Jewish people Israel. Um, there were other times in American history, as we went through before, where with you know the Japanese internment camps, we gave the Japanese people reparations, etc. But this country and international countries did not do anything to help black people, African people here in America 
or in Africa as well. And it's just, I have to keep pointing out just the, the fact that we would, we did it for other minority groups and other groups that suffered, but we didn't do it for black people who literally built this country and were a major part of the reason why we're so wealthy today and we're such a superpower today where we could, you know, take a, another minority group like the Jewish people, you know, come together with the United Kingdom, with Britain and work to give the Jewish people um, Israel, which is a conflict that's still going on today, but nothing was done to help African slaves here. Um, that's just, that just shows to me just the racial, the, the racism, the racism um, that is, that is put towards black people all across the world. Absolutely. Now we got a comment here from no known. She says this new generation coming up uneducated about this all due to legislation preventing the education is going to lead to another generation of white privilege, but on steroids, in my opinion. And I agree with that very much. So that's the danger of those uh, anti-critical race theory laws, uh, those that legislation that, by the way, Texas is the lead on that. Uh, Texas, Florida um, are really out there, you know, saying, no, we're not teaching slavery. It's, it's offensive to whites. And, you know, it didn't really happen like that. And they were really treated very well and all that craziness. Um, yeah. And, you know, it will cause this next generation of whites because of ignorance of this stuff to think that, well, blacks are in the position they're in, they're poor, they're this and that because they're, they're lazy, they're unintelligent, they're inferior. This is what God made for them. Not knowing, no, 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 no. This is by design. The system isn't broken. This is your, your ancestors de designed the system this way. And this is the reason why African people, African American people here in this country are so, um, it, it, the wealth of African American people are so beneath, so low, so lower than, than, than Europeans. Um, it, it's not, it has nothing to do with our in, inherent intelligence or, Morality, it's its because the system was designed to benefit your ancestors, young man. And and uh, I agree so much with No Nun that that young man will not have the benefit of understanding this because certain states have said we're not teaching that. That will make that young man uncomfortable to know that his great-great-grandfather benefited so much from the institution of slavery. And a lot of black folks as well. We have to yeah. put it on ourselves to teach our children. Amen. To teach the young people in our lives. My godson, for example, I asked him some question about, um, did he know something? I think it was about slavery or, or something like that. And whether or not that he was being taught in school. And he said, no, they were not teaching it. So every time I'm around him, I always make sure to teach black history and just, and go beyond slavery, go back to Africa. Tell, I tell him about Mansa Musa. I tell him about Jesus Christ <laughs> and what he did. I tell him about all of that because the schools are not teaching it. So I make sure that I do it. And we all have to do that. Those of us who are in the know and who have this knowledge. That's right. Very good. Tiffany and company. I grew up Ooh. hearing about the jeweler Tiffany. I like well, them too. Yeah. Ah. Well, here we go. Jeweler yeah. Charles Lewis Tiffany. Open the iconic flagship Tiffany shop on New York City's Broadway Street in 1837 with capital from his father, Comfort Tiffany, whose own fortune had been derived from the operation of a cotton manufacturing company in what would become Danielsonville, Connecticut. Archibald uh, Gracie Jr., the son of the... Um, uh, Eponymous, Sc Scottish, hope I pronounced that word right, international shipper of Gracie, Gracie Mansion fame, left New York City to become a cotton broker in Mobile, Alabama. Uh, the, the governor's mansion in New York is called Gracie 
mansion, by the way. And so all that comes from, again, the cotton industry. So this, this, this renowned jeweler, Tiffany and Company, I mean, you buy some jewelry from Tiffany, you're going to spend a lot of money and you're going to have some status. Well, it was all built on the backs of black people. Mm. And one of my, I mean, and a very famous artist, Beyonce, she just did a campaign with them a couple years ago that was very big where she wore, I guess, their most valuable diamond or something. And you know she's come out lately. I don't know if you did. I don't think I don't think you listened to her, but she's come out lately with her past few albums with talking about black people and black issue and black struggles. Yeah, is flaunting and wearing Tiffany and Company's diamonds. Wow. Yeah, I'm sure she probably doesn't know about this history either. Wow. I want to send this to her, <laughs> to her people. That's what. That's why more people need to tune in because we're gonna bring. We're gonna bring the heat. We're gonna bring the tea. We're gonna bring the knowledge. We're gonna bring it every time. Every time you're gonna hear something you didn't know. You're gonna learn every time, and we're bringing. We're bringing these quotes out of this book because we know some folks don't read. So we're dog on it. We'll read the book to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, it's so sad. The old saying, you want to hide something from a black man, put it in a book. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, all right, fine. We'll just read the book to you. Tune in and we'll <laughs> read it to you. That's what we're basically doing because all of these quotes came from, um, from here to equality. All right. Tiffany company. Who's next? Let's go now to the great universities of this country. Brown university was funded by slave labor. Brown is located in Rhode Island, funded by slave labor, the cotton industry. Who else? Princeton University, the great renowned Princeton University, funded from the cotton industry off the backs of black people. Who else? Harvard University, funded on the backs, the blood, sweat, and tears of black people. So, you know, these schools, Princeton, Brown, Harvard, we we look at them as being so illustrious and so awesome. And liberal well, and regal, that's right, all of that, Chloe. Well, they are what they are because they started from the slave labor of black people. So if all you think about it, Chloe, let's break it down. Let's suppose, let think about the professors and the students who were able to make all this money from, from the cotton industry. And so now they can dedicate their time to study, to research, to education, because they're, they're making a whole bunch of money from pennies of investment because of black folks down south. Okay? And some of them had slaves. You know, not nowhere near like the south, but some of these universities um, had actual slaves, enslaved people, pardon me. They had, they had some enslaved people that they actually, um, you know, had on their books. So yeah, you can be you can be considered smart and, and genius and all of that when you're getting that advantage from the work and effort, the blood, sweat, and tears of other people. Yeah, and, and be considered so liberal and elitist, yet your your very university was funded by slave labor. I mean, <laughs> I, and I don't know if that is why I know with Harvard. Um, they try to, I think it's, if a, a student's family makes less than, I think, uh, than $100,000, they'll, um, the student can attend tuition free and some other things that they try to do with scholarships. Um, but it obviously doesn't go far enough. Well, that's for, that's for black and white students, right? True. Yeah. That's for black and white students. Asians and. Asians, anyone who applies. Yeah. So that's not real reparations in my mind. Yeah, that's true. 
So, so they may be thinking, well, let's just do this because they know that Harvard knows its own history, but it doesn't, it is nowhere near what we're talking about. And it's not reparations at all because it's not focused on the descendants of um, blacks, black enslaved people. And and what is Harvard's endowment? What is it like $5 billion or something? Huge. It's huge. I mean, they'll never go broke. And where did that, where did that money, how were they able to accumulate that money? Chloe, because of the backbreaking work that enslaved Africans did, who oftentimes, I, I read and have heard of stories of some of the enslaved people just dying in the fields. Mm. And by the way, I'm from the country, all right? I worked in those fields. I'm, I wasn't old enough to pick cotton. Cotton was kind of gone by the time I was a teenager. But I worked in tobacco fields. And I won't even compare the work that I did in tobacco fields during the summer to buy school clothes with what our ancestors had to do as enslaved people. So I'm not making that com- comparison. But I got a small, 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 small taste of what it's like to be out in that sun in those fields working like that. But, again, it's, it's still there's no comparison. I could leave any time I wanted to. I was not anyone's property. I didn't work from sun up to sundown and then go to a shack or shanty house or, or you know, eat the slop and all. that. So I'm not comparing it. But I got a little small, 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 small taste of that. Mm. Harvard University. Yale. Let's not leave out Yale. I'm, I mean, Chloe, I'm bringing this out because we look at these schools as great schools. And only the smartest of the smartest people go to these schools. Well, they're not so smart. And they are not all of this when you realize these schools were built on the bodies of our ancestors. <clears throat> yeah. And the way they try to present themselves, too, as kind of above. Elitist, like you said earlier. Elitist. Yeah. Well, we didn't participate in those things that happened down south. Yes, you did. Yes, you Benefited did. from it. Big time. Huge. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Slaveholders were given land and money and all of that to these schools. That's how they got started. Mm. Columbia University. Okay, another institution that started and benefited from the bodies of our ancestors. Ah, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. (laughs) Interesting story behind this school's involvement with slavery, Chloe. This school, I don't know if people realize this, and it kind of touches home for us because we're originally from North Carolina. But this school was the very first public institution in the country. I didn't realize that. Yes, the other schools were private, but this was the first public institution. And all of its initial funding, every penny of it, all of the land that it built upon was contributed by plantation owners. Mm. UNC Chapel Hill. UNC Chapel Hill, Tar Heels. That's right. Today, some people would consider uh, Chapel Hill to be a rather liberal, progressive school. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't go so far with that because we see how liberal, progressive um, Chapel Hill treated um Miss Hannah Jones with her tenureship, right? 
Oh yeah, that the way they did um, Doctor Jones was absolutely horrendous. It was, and for those of you who don't know, Doctor Hannah Jones, she started the sixteen nineteen project. She's a very prolific professor, doctor, um, and that project and has gotten a lot everybody of. Everybody should read that book that came out of that project. Yes. Sorry. For yes. That. Yes. The 1619 Project. It's gotten a lot of backlash in conservative circles all across the country. Um, and basically the premise of the 1619 Project is uh, 1619 was the year that the first African person was brought to this country. And uh, Dr. Jones is saying, you know, that's really when um, that really should be the focal point of this country, because basically what we're saying here that this country was founded and built upon enslaved African people. Um, and so she got a lot of backlash for that. And she was up for tenure at a professorship job at UNC. And because of that backlash, they just completely treated her wrong. Didn't they, they never gave her tenure, right? Well, um, no. And yeah, she, in, in fact, she, she withdrew her name from consideration. Yeah. Yep. And now she's teaching at another college. I don't remember where. I think, didn't um, she go to Howard? Oh, yeah, I think it's Howard. I know it was the HBCU. Yeah, I think she ended up at Howard. So in the end, it, it worked out fine. But wow, the way they treated her was horrendous. So but yes, everyone, go check out the 1619 Project. Very inf informational. So yes, the storied Tar Heels has <laughs> its roots. In you putting some extra emphasis on it, Dad, because you were you were a um, Duke fan. But let's just, let's point that out a little bit. <laughs> hey, and in in, in 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 fairness. Duke University has history too. Here it is. Yeah. I knew you all were going to say that. I knew <laughs> for the folks who are listening, our house is divided down the middle when the Duke and Tar Heels are playing each other. I am the only person in my family, and I mean, I'm talking about my great big wide family, <laughs> not just my immediate family. I am the only Duke University fan. Well, Jamel is a Duke fan. Uh, but oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, he's a Duke fan. But other yeah. than that, it's just me. So I knew I had to, <laughs> I knew I had to mention Duke. So Duke also benefited from uh, from slavery. I want to go back, Chloe, and uh, recognize a couple of um, comments that uh, Rebels made. Uh, it is always such a pleasure to see Reverend Harper uh, with us. And he says, thanks for the knowledge. Uh, black history is paramount to the culture. Yes, thank you for... Uh, thanking us. It is our joy and honor to work during the week to research these issues so that we can bring uh, a show that is informative. Um, that's what we want. So that right there is the greatest um, thank you that you can give just recognizing that. So thank you. Thank you. And the political scientist asked, I think she's asking of me, did your family get paid for working in the tobacco field? Um, there's a bit of history there, uh, political scientists. Let me explain a little bit. My family, I was able to do my family research, and I was able to go back to 1830. I found my great-great-grandfather. He was on the Williams Plantation. My family's surname is Williams. We got that name from the family of uh, Captain Stephen Williams, um, who was a Confederate uh, colonel. And he enslaved my family. And um, after slavery ended, um, my family just basically stayed on his plantation and continued working for him. Um, they began to basically do sharecropping uh, for him and for other whites in the area. Uh, for example, my grandmother was a sharecropper on a white man's strawberry farm for many, many, many years. Uh, so where I grew up in North Carolina, yes, it's a bunch of farmland, tobacco, strawberries, corn, beans, et cetera. And, and during the summer months, uh, the young blacks 
not the young whites, but the young blacks were expected to go into the fields to work uh, to make money to buy your school clothes for the upcoming school year. So, yes, we were paid for that work. This was in the 70s. Um, this were in the 70s. But ironically, uh, one of the white men that we worked for, um, he had gone to the local prison camp and purchased an older black man who worked for him free on his farm. And I want to repeat that because I know your ears probably just said, what did I just hear? Yes, in the 70s, when I was a teenager, uh, there was a man that we worked for. His name was Lawrence. We called him Mr. Lawrence. He was a white man, big farmer. And Mr. Lawrence had went, had gone to the local prison in the 70s and purchased, purchased an older black man. We only knew him by his name, John. We called him Mr. John. Mr. John had to have been about 70, 80 years old. Lawrence went and paid for that man, bought him, and the state of North Carolina allowed Lawrence in the 70s to buy Mr. John. And Lawrence treated Mr. John like a slave. I seen him beat um, Mr. John with tobacco stalks. I saw that with my own eyes. I was probably 11, 12 years old. And out of everybody, I couldn't take it. I spoke up at, at 11 or 12 years old. It, it just got me. I just could not stand to see this white man treat this old black man like a slave. So this thing of justice was in me as far back as I can remember. I have, God just sensitized this to me. He put this on my heart. This has been a part of who I am, my calling for years. I had, to, I was probably 12 or 13 years old. And I remember my uh, aunts and grandmother would say, you know, be quiet, boy, be quiet. Keep your mouth closed. You, you, you too grown. You, you, you know, you, that ain't that you're going to get yourself hurt out here. You're going to make one of these white men jump on you or kill you or something out here running your mouth, you know. So so they were, you know, saying what they were saying to try to prevent me from, you know, like so many other young blacks who had spoken out against this racism from preventing me from getting killed or shot or or lynched or something. Um, but I had to speak out and I've been speaking out ever since. So. That's a long way of answering your question, um, political science. Yes, we did get paid for the work that we did. I think, if I recall, I made about $3 an hour. Um, but Mr. John, in the 70s, it brings me to tears thinking about it even now. Mr. John, in the 70s, was enslaved. He apparently had been in prison for something. I don't know what it was. And back then, North Carolina permitted white business owners to go to local prisons and buy, buy, literally buy black people. So that was 100 years after slavery ended, yet slavery was still going on in the state of North Carolina where I'm from. And still now today, because of the 13th Amendment, slavery was abolished in all instances. Um, except for when a person is convicted of a felony and go to prison. So we still have that in the 13th Amendment. A lot of people don't realize that slavery has not been completely abolished because of that exception in the 13th Amendment. So when a person is convicted of a felony um, under, the, under the 13th Amendment, it is as if they go back into slavery which is why a lot of um, convicted felons, their rights are taken away. Um, the state is able, if they go to prison, to basically do what they want with them. Um, and so that still exists. It's, it's sad, but it yeah. still does too. It, pursuant to the 13th Amendment, I remember I told a young man that, that um, I was representing in court, and he started crying. He had never heard that once he 
uh, was convicted of a felon, he would basically become a slave under our Constitution. Um, to more comments, your mom says, remember Blight Lives Matter recently demanded those Ivy League schools begin to deal with uh, their racist past? Absolutely. In fact, one that we'll mention here in a moment, Georgetown University, um, <clears throat> I think, uh, took some serious steps toward doing just that. Um, no none says there are many establishments in existence today that are rooted in the exploitation of minorities, that it can be difficult to maneuver on a day-by-day -day basis while avoiding these establishments. That is very true. Um, that is extremely true. You bring out a very important point. And so if we try to avoid all the establishments, all the companies, all the corporations, et cetera, that have benefited from, from slavery, yeah, we would almost have to leave the country. So I guess we are not suggesting that we completely, because we can't, you know, just cut ourselves off from these corporations. Like I said, we bank with Chase, knowing that Chase, um, its early beginnings was based on the cotton industry, based on slavery. Um, but it's just still good to, to be aware of it. And where we can, I think we should withdraw our support from certain corporations. Um, I'm trying to think of, of, of some where, for, for example, for me, for me, this is me. This is my, I just thought about it. I have not watched a National Football League game. I, I have boycotted the NFL. My wife and I haven't, we love football. I mean, she's a football fanatic. And, I mean, football is, is huge in our family. It was a Sunday get-together for uh, me and my wife and, and, and Chloe and, and my son, Caleb. But the way they dealt with um, Kaepernick, the way they have dealt with the coaches, the way have, they have just dealt with the issues of race, I balk out of them. I, I said, that's enough. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not lending my eyes and, and spending my money with an organization that racist. I'm not doing it. So where we can, I think we should withdraw our support. I wish the black community at large would do so where we can. But you're right. It's it. You know, slavery runs so deep in this country. The the cotton industry and the exploitation of black people runs so deep that man, we would have to basically go to another country <laughs> uh, to completely avoid all the um, all the, the the corporations that have benefited from this institution. Good. We point. can also ask the or demand that the government. Um, hits them where it hurts, which is their money, which is to tax these corporations and then use it to um, supply money reparations for black descendants of slaves. I think that that would be one solution um, to really get their attention and to really um, uh, repudiate. What were the four R's? Help me, Dad. <laughs> yeah. Um, recognize the injustices repudiate them, repent from them, and repair the results of them. Take that money that they tax these corporations with, um, put it into some type of fund with the government, and give reparations to black descendants of slaves. Yes. All right. Um, trying to move along here. Uh, no Known says we must continue to try to avoid them until they take responsibility for the roots. And the show and and this show makes it easier for us all to do just that. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Uh, the you. political scientist says I am a man. So I think I think one of us <laughs> may have referred to the political scientist as she or her. So thank you for letting us know. Um So yeah, uh, <laughs> there's some other comments here. I'm trying to move on a little bit. Um, Georgetown. So yes, Georgetown. 
But Georgetown at least acknowledged and are trying to, last I heard, Georgetown was trying to um, do some reparations for the descendants of the 200 or so slaved, enslaved blacks. From what I understand, Georgetown at one point um, had enslaved about 200 or so people and they sold those 200 or so people to pay off some debts, okay? And they were trying to find the descendants of those 200 or so people and were offering them different types of reparation. Brooks Brothers. Now, going back to something No Known said here just a second ago, you know, this runs so deep, how do we avoid it? Well, here, here we go here, Brooks Brothers. This is a store that I have bought many suits from over the years. As a matter of fact, as of probably, I would say over the last 15 years, I haven't bought a suit from any store other than Brooks Brothers. This is where I buy my suits, okay? And I know and knew that they were knee-deep in slavery. That's how they were built, the Brooks Brothers, those brothers, uh, were knee deep in the institution of slavery, um, you know. So I, I, I very well may make that decision not to buy anything else from Brooks Brothers, um, you know. Just, you know, the the way this is is sort of striking me. Um, yeah, you love you a suit from Brooks Brothers, that absolutely. They make some great suits for a relatively affordable price. I mean, the suits I've bought from them, they still last to this day. They still look good 15 years later. And I also buy only Allen Edmund shoes. You know, this is when I'm in court. Um, and I haven't researched Allen Edmonds. I don't know if they have some history in slavery, but I would not be surprised. Yeah. Brooks Brothers, New York Life. So we saw... The banks, now we're seeing the, and then we looked at the, the universities, now the insurance companies, because a lot of these enslaved people had to be insured. The ships that were traveling and bringing them back and forth from Africa, those ships had to be insured. This is one of the big, one of the big, big insurance companies that insured a lot of those ships and a lot of those enslaved people, New York Life. Another I've one. never thought about that. The, yes. the insurance companies. That's right. Being involved in the slave trade. Wow. Yeah, because if you think about it, I tell you what, if you think about slavery as a business, well, what do you do with the stuff you value and don't and and you don't want to suffer a loss if 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 you lose it or if it's stolen or or destroyed? You insure it. Wow. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Like your car, like your house, like other stuff you insured. So they insured our ancestors mm. and the insurance companies that wrote a lot of those policies, New York life, Aetna and others. So the, in, the insurance industry knee deep in slavery. Last of all, well, not last of all, but the, another big portion is the uh, railroad industry. Back, uh, blacks basically built the railroad system. Okay? I remember my father, one of his earliest jobs was on the railroad line, laying those metal pieces. Hmm. Isn't that how Rockefeller made most of his money? Uh, I think Rockefeller was involved in, in the railroad system. I think he was also involved in all, oh. in, you know, uh, different, different things. Um, yeah. So we just see my point here is slavery is, slavery was the foundation of most industries that built and made America the great nation that it is. Wow. Not to leave out the White House. Slaves built it. 
Enslaved Africans built the White House and the Capitol building. All right? So now we come to the question that we have given you 32 exhibits. If we were in trial, these would be exhibits. We have given you 32 exhibits today. We gave 15 or 20 exhibits in part two. And there were 15 or 20 exhibits in part three. And we offered expert testimony through Professor William Darity and um, his co-author, Ms. Sullivan, and expert testimony from Edward Batista, okay, through their books. So now the question becomes, if you all, you listeners, were the jury members, we would now ask for a certain amount of damages. Mm. If you all believe that we have made our case, then we would ask for some damages. So as I promise you, the very last thing that I want to show you is what amount of money do we believe would adequately close the wealth gap and set African Americans up to have a better future, especially those who have been left behind. Now, there are some African Americans who are doing fabulously well. LeBron James, Oprah Winfrey, Michael Jordan, Joseph Smith, Robert Johnson. We could name many who are doing quite well. They often tend to be in the entertainment industry or athletes and so on, but they make up a fraction of the African-American community. And so we're talking about the African-American community collectively. What amount of money would compensate and redress our community for slavery, Jim Crow, and systemic racism? Well, we have a figure. Professor William Darity, again, the author of From Here to Equality, estimates that 10 to $12 trillion to eligible black Americans would be enough reparations to redress the past and set us up for a better future. 10 to $12 trillion to eligible black Americans. And one of the eligibility requirements that he mentions is that they would have to be able to trace their descendancy back to an enslaved person. Mm. 10 to 12 trillion. Yes. Which, when you think about it, is really nothing compared to the amount of wealth that America has amassed throughout the years. Throughout the 400 years, um, since slavery, it's nothing. We sent just to Ukraine this year, what, about $2 trillion in money? Been that much? I want to say it was about a trillion dollar in money and about, and billions of dollars in weapons. Wow. That's amazing. Just this year. Let me check and verify that. All right, some last comments. The political scientist, he says, thank you for answering. You're absolutely welcome. Uh, no, no. You're right about the NFL, the race norming. Oh, boy. That's right. I forgot to mention that race norming policy is outright blatantly racist. Mm. You're Absolutely right. Basically, for those who don't know what that race norming policy is, essentially the NFL had agreed to pay damages to uh, former football players who had suffered CTE. 
And, you know, CTE is this um, brain damage that some football players experience from getting banged upside the head and falling on their heads and all that doing football. And, but in order to prove their eligibility, they had to be seen by a doctor and a doctor had to sign off on uh, whatever award they were trying to get. And the NFL required of black players, uh, basically the NFL required of doctors that they sort of reduce uh, potential um, brain damage to black players on the theory that black players had less has less cognitive abilities in the first place. <laughs> so I mean, I mean, this yeah. really this is this really happened. Uh, so le- I don't know the exact numbers, but let's suppose let's suppose you needed a score of ten to get awarded some compensation, some retirement money, and let's say a black paced person got a a ten. The doctor said, okay, yeah, you have suffered some CTE here. I'm going to score you at 10. Well, the race norming policy of the NFL would require that that 10 be reduced on the theory that black players had less cognitive ability in the first place. Mm. So in other words, black players probably started out at at negative (laughs) one. So reduce Mm. their score from 10 to nine, which basically meant, Chloe, many black players were being denied the money because of that race norming. I mean, that is blatantly, it, you're, okay, you're already racist for the way you dealt with Kaepernick and him trying to bring attention to issues that affected 70% of your workforce. You're already racist for not uh, hiring black coaches um, at a, an equitable rate. You're already racist for not having any black owners, right? But then on top of that, on top of all of that, you have, you create this explicitly, blatantly racist policy to deny those same black players compensation for injuries they suffered making you billions. I said, no way can I support an an, an organization like this. No way. No way. Nope. They just model what the United States government has done and what businesses have done in this country, you know, using um, slave slave labor to make these trillions of dollars, as we talked about before, and then not giving um, those enslaved people or, or former enslaved people reparations, the same thing that they did with the NFL. They just modeled it. Um, after what the government has done, so it 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 just blankets our our entire um, country um, and economy. And earlier, I mentioned that we gave uh, I think a two trillion dollars to um, Ukraine. It was actually forty billion, okay. and um, some other billions in weapons. But that's a big difference. That's a big difference. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting ready to say whoa. <laughs> Uh, I thought I had read somewhere that it had it was a trillion, but no, it was in the billions. But it's still my larger point is still our economy, the wealth that America has amassed, the taxation that the government does. If we tax more of the rich and these corporations that have benefited from slave labor, we can meet that number and give reparations to black descendants of slaves. That's what we deserve. And that's what this country needs, that atonement. In fact, no known, you you, you make an excellent point there before I talk about no known's last comment. I, I, I think maybe, I think you probably said the most important thing throughout this whole uh, conversation today, Chloe, and that is we can't move on until this injustice has been dealt with. We, as a nation, we can't move on. In fact, dare I say, I don't think that there will ever be peace between the races in, in this country until reparations have been paid. 
because that is just this big sore, this, this big wound that just can't heal until it gets proper attention. So we're going to, we're going to always have that issue. It's, it's, it's really what you hear protesters saying, no justice, no peace. Yep. Bottom line. So I think what you said is really the most important part. It's not just, it's not just about getting financial economic compensation but it's also about being able to move on so we can just move on from this whole issue. As black Americans, we can move on. As white Americans, we can move on. Yeah. All right? So, yes, thank you for saying that. Uh, no Known says, I would, I would argue that an African American should automatically qualify for the reparations and shouldn't have to prove their slavery lineage and the burden should fall on the government to prove they don't. All right. Okay. <laughs> All okay. Right. All right. That makes it okay. really interesting. <laughs> well, what do you say about that, Chloe, as we come to a close? Um, I think we have to define what an African-American is because I know that Let's take Elon Musk, for example. He was born in South Africa. Technically, he is African. Ah, great point. Now, great, point. Hmm? great point. Now he lives in Texas, actually. So now he is African-American. I don't believe it's that he should qualify. Over $200 billion. Exactly. And has come out, and has come out, by the way, as a very deeply ultra-conservative person here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah. no, very much ahead. so. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, a first generation African person, um, I don't know if they should qualify either. I, I, I think it needs to be a black descendant of a slave, of an enslaved person um, in this country. Well, <laughs> I, I would, I would, I would want to know from no known I, because there's the, the, the statement um, leaves something open and that is, and, and I don't know if this is a, I believe this is a she, right? Are you, no, yeah, no, I think she is. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I, no known leaves something open. She leaves a question unanswered. And that is, so she says that if you're black, then you um, shouldn't have to prove that you are, dis are descendant of, of enslaved people. Uh, but the government has the burden of proving that you are not. So the assumption is if you're black, you descended from slavery. All right. So my question is, if the government was able to prove that that black person was not a descendant of slavery, would they then, no known in your opinion, should they then be denied reparations? Is my question clear, Chloe? Yeah. So basically, the basic assumption is if you're if you're a Black American, you're the, you qualify for well, reparations. Well, she didn't say. Did she say? She said African American. Yes. Okay. Or African American. Yeah. But same thing. I, like I said, African American could be Elon Musk. But if we're just thinking of it as Black people. Okay. Well. Okay. Hold on. You're right. Okay. I got to go back to your comment. So Black American and African American are not are not the same thing necessarily. Based Not necessarily. On, I don't okay. think. All right. So I think she's talking about black American. So let's assume she's talking about black American. Okay. So the basic assumption, that if you're a black American, you qualify for reparations unless the government can prove that you were not a descendant of, of, of slave. So yes, I guess the question is, okay, then can you, if the government proves that this black American is not a descendant of a slave, does she um, believe that they then don't qualify for affirmative? I mean, <laughs> reparations. Well, Claude, we're old for two. No known is also a guy. So. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, my bad. <laughs> Sorry about that. You all. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. I, 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 and by the way, I am very hardened and encouraged to know that brothers are tuning in. Yes. Yeah, for real. Seriously. Yes. yes that is yes. awesome. 
So thank you for pointing out, no, no, that you no, know, you 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 are you are a dude. <laughs> <laughs> but but we do want you to answer that question. So so we understand what you're saying that a black American should, uh, based on default, be approved unless the government can prove that they are not a descendant of slave of slavery. So our question is, suppose the government, in fact, proves that this black American did not descend from slavery, then does the government, should the government be able to deny reparations for that person? That's a question because there were some free black folks back then as well. I mean, there were not a lot, but there were some some free black folks. Um, some some black people went up to Canada, and then they may have come down. They come back down to um, the United States. You know, some people immigrated from Africa, maybe in the late 1800s or 1900s, or the Caribbean. So, I mean, that's a good question. There's all those questions. Yeah. So, no, no, we're waiting on that answer. Let us know. And no, no says to be completely open. I'm Native American. Well. Look, you've been done wrong too. So yes. <laughs> so uh, yes. I remember when Nelson Mandela came here in 1990. Um, you know, obviously there is there there's connection between a black African and black Americans, obviously. But he said something that I think stunned a lot of people. He said that although obviously he had a kindred spirit with black Americans, he said he really, really, however. Uh, could identify even more so with Native Americans because they were the original landowners and had been treated so badly by Europeans. And that was kind of the same thing they had suffered. They were the original landowners and um, were co colonized. So, yeah. so no, you, my point is that's why we started. The, the, the story of slavery actually begins with Native Americans because – the land was stolen from Native Americans. And now we are aware that there were some Native Americans who also uh, owned slaves uh, as well. But based on my research, many of them did that because of their effort of trying to sort of fit in uh, with the Europeans. Um, uh, and it has not been to me enough for African Americans to see Native Americans as you know, the enemy. Uh, although there were some Native Americans who owned slaves and and in every group of people, every group of people, you got bigots, you got races, you got some black races, you got some Native American races, you got, you know, European, Caucasian races and so on. But we just appreciate you um, showing up and participating and asking questions, great questions, by the way. And, and, um, in your comments. So uh, you don't have to be black to be a part of this show. In fact, it makes it even more interesting to have a diverse audience. Yeah. Yeah. We want rebels of all colors. That is right. It's a great question though. I think, um, I think no, no answered our question. Let me see. There would be a second category based on when arrival occurred because they may have still been harmed when, uh, still been harmed even if not trying, to, uh, even if not tying to slavery lineage. That's, that's a very, 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 very thoughtful question. Um, and it is not one I figured out. Um, Maybe William Darity in his book from from here to equality has figured that out. I think he did. I, I will, I will look at it again. And your mom points out that uh, Russell Wilson, um, who is uh, the starting quarterback for Denver, the Denver Broncos, is, uh, descended from free blacks. Mm. So as you that's said, that's a good point, man. Yeah. You know, as you said, there are many free blacks. So that ties into no known here. Um. Um, uh, the political scientist just made a very provocative statement saying that we're, we're all Native Americans, not black. 
or African American. Check the cinches. I love it. I love it. <laughs> bring it on, baby. Bring it on. Bring it on. Bring it on. But I mean, what what this country has done to Native Americans is is just it's horrendous. The pillaging, the raping, the killing. You know, bringing all of the diseases, forcing Native American children to assimilate. The trail of tears. Um, yes to assimilate into uh, white culture. Um, the Trail of Tears, like you said, that I, I mean, and uh, me and my brother, we took a trip to Utah a couple months ago and we looked at some of the bison and it just touched me so profoundly how when the European, European settlers came to this country, there were millions of bison in this country and the Native Americans, a lot of Native American um, nations relied heavily on the bison. The bison were sacred to them. The bison were everything. It was the source of their economy based on the research that I've done. And by killing the bison, the, the government purposely, purposefully targeted the bison in order to kill off the Native Americans. So the bison went from millions and millions, um, tens of millions in this country to now I think there's maybe less than a thousand and wow. that was purposefully done to try to harm um the native american communities wow. that rely so heavily on them man yeah man so yeah um so there's a legitimate claim from native americans for reparations in other words Mm -hmm. All right. So it's been almost two hours. We really wa wasn't trying to go that long, but thank you all for staying with us. And we hope you, you got something from this. Remember tomorrow is June 19th. And that was the reason why we did this um, show in the first place for the last three weeks. Um, so celebrate Juneteenth tomorrow. I think we all get Monday off. Um, so um, enjoy it. We enjoyed having every single one of you. We enjoyed the questions and the comments. Um, thank you, sweetheart, my wife, for being the producer. Um, and happy Father's Day, Dad. Tomorrow uh -huh. is Father's Day. Wow. I will not get off of this live without sending you a public um, happy Father's Day I am just, me and Caleb, we're just so blessed to have you as um, our father, the leader of our family, um, business counselor, spiritual advisor, pastor, all of that. We are just so blessed to have you. And um, I love you very, very, very much. It is a, such a pleasure to be able to You're be in business with you. You're trying to cry up here <laughs> in front of these folks. That's what you're trying to do. <laughs> I had to say it. I mean, it's just such a blessing. It's such a blessing and an honor to be able to do all of this with you and with mom. So happy Father's Day and happy Father's Day to all of our listeners who are fathers as well. You know, when when I hear some, when I hear you and Caleb say, um, you know, kind words and happy Father's Day and all that to me, in my mind, you know where my mind goes to? Where? To your mom. Um, you know, uh, she is really the one, she's the one to me, um, who is all that in a bag of chips for the corporate family. She is. Yeah. She uh, really is. Yeah. I mean, really, I appreciate it all, but I just, I just honor her and, uh, yeah. but thank you nonetheless. I appreciate it. I've done the best I could for you and Caleb and, um, no none says thank you for a very insightful discussion thank you for participating and uh, that's what we that's the word out please like share and continue showing up and commenting when we do these i promise you they won't be two hours every time this one was just special given that it's juneteenth so before we talk another 30 minutes we're going to get out of here and just one last thing let us know what topics you would like us to talk about as well yeah, we love doing these deep dives into um, various topics like we did with reparations. So let us know down below as well. Like, comment, share. Yes. It's been a pleasure. Peace, love, and soul.
Happy Juneteenth. Happy Father's Day, y'all. One other thing. I don't know if y'all can hear me. Please pray for my family. I had death in my family. Uh, my oldest sibling, Gloria Young, um, passed. Well, she's not a young now. She's married. But she passed a couple of days ago. Keep my family in prayer. God bless you all. We are out of here. Happy Father's Day to all of you fathers. Bye-bye.